Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 32. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. And our list is another long one today. So we have a few things we'd like to discuss. The uh, The Archbishop of Milan has written a letter which appears to endorse homosexuality. This is uh, Delpini. We have just had the Day for Migrants. Was this the 24th of September, Mark, the Day for Migrants? Yeah. This yeah, week. so just just gone this week. We've had we've had the day for migrants. So that might open up a conversation about um, the focus on uh, migrants and refugees. We may be familiar with uh, the Lawrence Fox affair at GB News, so we may have something to say about that. The nuncio to Washington has spoken about noisy U.S. Catholics who should listen to the Pope, uh, and also something very interesting, especially to Gavin, who spent quite a lot of time at Teze. Uh, in previous years, that uh, Christopher Lamb at the Tablet podcast has spoken to the new prior of Teze. So there's a few things we'd like to say in response to that. Uh, and just today, the news that the traditional Latin mass will no longer be celebrated at the high altar at Westminster Cathedral. And also, if we have time, I'd quite like to speak about this group of campaigners, 10 men and 10 women, as I understand, who've walked, I think, from Canterbury to the Vatican in Rome to raise awareness of abuse some of them are victims of abuse themselves and to call for zero tolerance and perhaps we could talk about what pope francis understands as zero tolerance and what they're calling for and the difference between the two so it's a long list we'll do our best so perhaps we might start with or should we just start with the day for migrants mark since it's um since we've had that, oh, that <laughs> on the 24th this week so yeah. what is this the purpose of this day and what does this tell us about um the, pon- the pope francis pontificate uh i don't really i'm not i don't really care i mean <laughs> can we I'll talk just, about a day I'm, for migrants he says just, that's, that's, <laughs> no, i want to talk about a day for migrants but in the context in a particular context and i think it, it works well hand in hand with the uh the Climatology nonsense as well. Um, oh, and, yeah, sorry, and so, sorry, that's my mistake. I'm talking about the day for migrants, and I'm mixing it up with the climate. Well, but, there's, but I think they are. Things, yeah, they're, they're together. They the day, I think yeah. they are linked. And like the, so, I've been ranting on about this all week, and you two haven't really. You've gone yes, Mark, patted me on the head. But I've got really <laughs> sort of passionate about it, and I've written an article for the Herald, but I'm not sure that it will be published because there's someone else has posted a someone else has had an article published which is about Pope Francis's welcoming migrants and basically taking the same thing as me. Like, why is he going on about this for? So what? So what am I, what's the point? Right. So the point is that on the World Day for Migrants, we had 24 videos posted on the Catholic Bishops of England and Wales Twitter page. I don't think I've ever seen them as excited about anything ever before. And uh, Cardinal Nichols posted this sort of three-minute video about the... That the fundamental dignity of human be- of every person should uh, inform our approach when it comes to welcoming the stranger and blah 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 all this stuff right cool we go, you know totally on side with that and it's the same thing with the climate change stuff I love posting all this if you go to any of the Facebook pages or Twitter feeds of the diocese that's everything they post all right there might be the odd one oh it's you know Saint Vincent or Lorenz's feast day or whatever, but the vast majority of the stuff that they're posting is climate change. It's, you know, sort of capital building, wooden farms. It's, you know, uh, all this stuff about migrants that we have to welcome the stranger. And I, I think it's interesting in a week where Suella Braverman has given this keynote speech in, in America, where she's basically said that it's destroying Western civilization, that, you know, and fettered migration is is a serious problem and I, you know i think that the unnuanced approach of the bishops mm. to what is a prudential issue this is not a matter of faith that, that so no catholic is under any obligation to heed them when they talk about this stuff and it causes a massive problem because you know when you when you start talking about i mean i've got no problem with they want to talk about prudential stuff but i think they need to make it clear what, where they're coming from with it. And with both these issues, I think there are big problems. One is that they're... So the first is they're playing party politics, really obviously, 
because they're they're putting themselves, they're aligning themselves with a political party and against, especially in a week where you've got the Home Secretary making such a clear statement. And the second is that it's a very unnuanced approach. Then they're not speaking to the the concerns of people. Um, then there's no discussion of what you know what any of this means or of what the church teaches. The social teaching of the church is very clear on it. It teaches that we need to uh, that that we need to balance our welcome of the stranger and the right of people to live in peace and you know without war with the need for countries to regulate their borders for the because you can argue for the dignity of the human person for both things can't you you can say you know that it's people it's everyone's fundamental human dignity that they get to live a life free of violence and you know, with a wage and all those things, labour and exercise, we can go through all the documents, Rerum and Navarro. But, like, on the other side of it, is if that has a damaging, a detrimental effect to the society. Now, I'm not saying it does or whether it does or whether it doesn't, and obviously we know that immigration is, has a massively enriching effect on our society, so I'm not coming at it from that point of view at all. But there are... There are you know, we've got this situation where we've got unfettered migration and we've got it on the US border as well as across the channel. Um, it's sort of, you know, fighting age young men form the majority of it. There's no controls over who's being let in or and, and we've seen violent actions in our towns and cities as a result of that. And the bishops just seem to ignore all of those concerns. Why don't they speak to those concerns? Why don't they talk about what the church teaches and why the church teaches it. And that's without even mentioning the fact that they never mention soteriology or, you know, uh, ecclesiology or, you know, we never talk about why the gospel is important mm -hmm. or why we need to save souls or any, none of these things are the, the, the right to life or none of those things are important. And so just quickly before, I, so the other thing is like the same thing can be applied to the climate change argument. You know, Gavin posted a brilliant thing this week, and that like so we adapt. So we've got this attitude that we need to have renewables, but renewables are damaging the environment. So really, we're we're seeing, especially in California, that the the environment is being destroyed for the sake of you know cheaper energy or for having renewable energy. And you can't, you know, you like the thing that Gavin posted was that when they when the windmills fail, they bury the blades in the. No, in the dirt. And all these things have to be made and all the rest of it. But I mean, fundamentally, if you think about um, there are some countries where you've seen much more um, renewable energy being invested in wind farms and solar energy. And no, like, you know, in this country, we've got no one wants any, you know, no one wants any of these things built. Like none of the parties will commit to any energy policy at all. And, you know, if you look at a model like France, where you've got their energies half that of Germany, you know, or, or a quarter, the costs are much lower than they are in Germany. And why is that? It's because they've adopted nuclear energy, which is safe, regular, you know. So I just think this unnuanced is when you start talking about prudential issues like this that aren't within the competency of the church, you run the risk of making the magisterium look stupid, look clownish, because you're you're you've got the bishops talking about this stuff and we don't know what the science, you know, that are, what are they experts in the science? And now Pope Francis is coming out with a second Lodato C. The first one was bad enough. If you ask me, what a load of old rubbish. And now we've got another one. Yeah, exactly. exactly what right. do you think? Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's, um, you know, when you see that they, they don't allow any more licenses and, um, they say we're not going to, you know, we're going to have zero emissions and they adopt these policies and you see them as sort of political vote winners or, or at least uh, perhaps they're not, but they're, they, they they think they will be. And so, but they still need the, the, the uh, LPG. So they're importing it and then they're paying for it to be imported. So there's that cost and they're still using it anyway, but they're saying, look, because it looks good on paper that we haven't produced it. And it's, you think, well, how is that any better? Then it, then it really does just look like virtue signaling, because you think you're still using the stuff, you still need the stuff, you can get the stuff here and employ people and give jobs and and and, and utilize what you have, but instead you bring it in because it 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 avoids, you know, it, it looks like you're you're doing a better job. So it's you you sort of sense this 
this that what you sense sometimes is that it isn't really about care for the environment or stewardship of the earth. Uh, and I so think that's what's frustrating is because it isn't and and we that we're being told things that we're told we absolutely must believe even when there is there isn't actually disagreement this is not settled the very idea of settled science is d- doesn't make sense anyway uh, and then other voices are being blocked and you think well this this is not this is tyrannical this isn't this isn't care and stewardship and then for the pope to get on i think the most important point you've made in terms of our catholic focus is exactly that that this is whether in migration or the issues related to the environment these are prudential matters this is what i don't think people seem to understand the right to life life from the moment of conception till the moment of natural death are not prudential these it's these fine. are absolutes uh, so yeah. so these are different matters there is a hierarchy of truth not to say one thing is true and one thing isn't but but rather something is 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 an absolute and so that has to be something we pay attention to to what our church says and there's no room for dis- there's no room for debate and discussion you can't say well i happen to disagree i think we can kill babies up to 4 years old there's no room for that but there is room to say well we, we this is not within us our, our we can we can make recommendations we can advise we can say this is what we think but there's no there's nothing that in that that by conscience that means you're bound to have to agree with what the pope is saying on these matters and that's the thing but you we're sort of led to think if you don't well you're not being you call yourself a catholic how many of well, you, you, th- you must have had that call yourself a catholic you think the bishops are on a bit of a they think they're on a bit of a safe wicket with this because obviously the majority of uk catholics are immigrants so but sure. it, that. You know, like that's what frustrates me is that they're playing this game. They play this ball because they think it's safe. It's uncontroversial. Yeah. Come on, everyone loves migrants and everyone loves, everyone wants to save the environment. And it's uncontroversial. Well, our Lord said he came to bring a sword precisely because the gospel, the gospel is, you know, a message that you have to choose yes or no, don't you? Yeah. And what do you do with that when you say, actually, everyone loves migrants, but actually these people, in fact, are struggling with the costs associated with unfettered migration. What do you do about those people? Do you just go, well, let's brush them away. That's a bit embarrassing. Like you have to deal with the reality of it. That's the nuance. You have to deal with the reality and these unintended consequences. This is not just pie in the sky. Let's just make these. These, these, these are issues that affect real people's lives and their families. And there's there's a tension there that we need real guidance on. We can't just have airy fairy posters of everyone hugging around the earth. That's not reality. That's not how we can manage. Sorry, Gavin, we're both ranting. (laughs) So we're being blackmailed. We're being blackmailed by socialist clerics. And I don't agree with Mark. Migration is not a cultural enrichment. In my lifetime, migration has desperately weakened social cohesion in a way that can never be recovered. Uh, and as it happens, I have my favourite migrants. I quite like the Poles. Um, there are other European migrants I really quite like. But the fact that I quite like them has got nothing to do with the fact that migration is a disaster and we're being blackmailed. And we're being blackmailed by the misuse of scripture and Christian tradition. So the first thing is, that if you look in the Old Testament, there is indeed uh, guidelines for being generous to the stranger. But guess what? They have to accommodate themselves to Israel's law. You don't intermarry with them. They do not get to bring their own gods. They have to adopt the law and the prophets. Uh, There are strict conditions upon which uh, people who are vulnerable are invited into the society. And there is no comparison whatsoever, none whatsoever, between the experience that Israel faced and mass migration in the Western world at the moment. You cannot extrapolate theologically one to the other. So that's the first thing. The next thing is, I've thought about this for a very long time, and it's taken me about 35 years to become convinced, but now I'm convinced. Matthew 25 is not about the stranger you don't know, the naked person you don't know, the person in prison you don't know. It's all about the early church's suffering for the witness to Jesus, because Jesus only calls brothers those who are his disciples and his followers. Insofar as you do it to these, the least of my brothers, you do it to me. There is nowhere in the Gospels where he takes this universalistic view of humanity and calls people his brothers. He just doesn't do it. And Matthew 25 is a period, is, is, a, is a chapter all about judgment. And it's going to be about the way in which the rest of the church paid attention to the suffering church as the church 
suffers for witness to Jesus. And all the categories that appear in the sheep and the goats passage are what happened to the Christians the moment the great expulsion took place. There's nothing to do with migration in that. It's not to do with politics. It's not to do with strangers. As it happens, there's nothing wrong with feeding the poor, uh, sharing your goods. It's an act of compassion. But it's not mandated. But so it's, it's not, up our, to but us it's to not th- our fellow man, Gavin, whether they're African, Asian, European, whatever. It's not our fellow human person, the fellow human man, um, our, our brother or sister. The, the the whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers, you do to me. And that's no, not no, no. Jesus is talking theologically. He's not talking genealogically. The, the language of the gospel sometimes has a particular codified theological content. When Jesus uses brothers, he's talking about people who are within the household of faith. So if you want to know what you do to the stranger in the road who needs your help, he tells a very interesting story. It's called the Good Samaritan. But it's about what one person does to another person. And it's all about your personal duty about the to people you... No, it, well, it, it, it's about it's bringing about people the into the church. You see, I think there's a, that this ties in with the unity and ecumenism. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, uh, this idea of yes, I understand we have migration, and uh, rather than multiculturalism, there needs to be assimilation. We need to have a sense of our nation, national identity, and then people can come and are very welcome as long as they assimilate with that national identity. But there also needs to be some level of control and borders and nations matter. So there's no good saying our nation's the best, so then we we eradicate all other nations. Um, I'm just a bit, maybe you need to, maybe explain it to me a bit more clearly. Uh, I don't understand the parable of the Good Samaritan as something other than Christ giving us the church for, for universally for everyone, for all people. The, the parable of the Good Samaritan was in answer to the question, who is my neighbour? Which is a very, which is not, not my brother, not my sister, my neighbour. So, so let's leave the brother and sister stuff out for the moment. That's the household of faith language from Matthew 25. So who is my neighbour? My neighbour is anybody who has a, has a moral claim upon my resources. So we, that's absolutely right. But it's a bit, first of all, it's an individual thing. I'm sure you're right in saying it can be extended to be uh, to, to be an example for the church. I'm sure the church should collectively behave with the same moral probity as the individual. But it starts off by saying, if I have the resources and I come across uh, a human being who who is in trouble, he has a moral claim on my help. That's got nothing to do with migration. And, and it's absolutely not got to do with collective either. And the, the danger of turning it into a parable for the church is that you then move it from individual responsibility to, towards collectivism. And the reason that matters at the moment and why we shouldn't do it is because the whole basis for, say, for not resisting mass migration is that the stranger, the, who has now become a theological category, he doesn't, he doesn't have in Scripture. The stranger now becomes the, the migrant victim. And all migrant victims have to be given preferential treatment according to socialist and woke doctrine. That's not Christian. That's not in the Bible. That's not in the church either. We're entitled to deal with migration on its merits, and it doesn't have any. Yeah, I don't disagree that I think we can't, you know, this is a political issue. How do we manage migration um, in a way it's that... It's a political issue, and, and, and it's not a, a theological politi- one. It's a political issue, but also how do we as Catholics... Um, respond, but uh, to to the question of migration in a in a ha- what is the Christian response? But what I think I'm I'm not understanding what you're saying because ultimately we're still we are one human family. It's a separate political question about how we manage the land in which no, we we're live. Not. No, we, we're not a family. At we all. are universal. So we're, we're one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We and the very yes. fact that we're Catholic is universal. So. We are one church, whether we're Catholic in Africa or Asia or wherever. Or um, we're, we're one we're church. One. I'm not even sure I would agree that the church is a family. The fam- the, the, to, to use the idea, where does Jesus say the church is a family in the Gospels? Well, the church is his body. It's not a family. No, but we are the body of Christ. It's an organism. It's an organism. It's a living organism of which you and me okay. and Mark are a part. And so is, I don't know, Bob the Catholic down the road and... No, Mark, the jump in. The... Well, I'm just reading. Pope <laughs> I'll just quickly read all of Pope Benedict. <laughs> Give us Benedict. He's better than well, all of us. He's so, only better than on me. that bit, he says um, the concrete question is who is meant by neighbour? The conventional answer, answer for which scriptures, scriptural support could be adduced was that neighbour meant a 
fellow member of one's people, which is what we're saying, isn't it? Gavin saying, yeah. Gavin saying, yeah. Oh, um, I went, I went much further than that. I said it's anybody who has a claim on on our moral care. Much further than that. A people is a community of solidarity in which everyone bears responsibility for everyone else. In this community, each member is sustained by the whole, and so each member is expected to look on every other member as himself, as a part of the same whole that gives the space in which to live his life. Does this mean, then, that foreigners, men belonging to another people, are not neighbours? This would go against scripture, which insisted upon love for the foreigners also, mindful of the fact that Israel itself had lived in the life of a foreigner in Egypt. It remained a matter of controversy, though, where the boundaries were to be drawn. Generally speaking, only the sojourner living among the people was re re reckoned as a member of the community of solidarity and so as a neighbour. Other qualifications of the term enjoyed a wide currency as well. Rum rabbinic saying ruled that there was no need to regard heretics, informers and apostates as neighbours. It was also taken for granted that Samaritans, who were non not long before, had defiled the temple precincts in Jerusalem by strewing dead men's bones during the Passover festival itself were not neighbours. Now that the question has been focused in this way, Jesus answers it with the parable of a man on his way from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho who falls among robbers, is stripped of everything, and then is left lying half dead on the roadside. That was a perfectly re realistic story because such assaults were a regular occurrence of the Jericho Road. A priest and a Levite, experts in the law who know about salvation, are its professional servants, come along but they passed by without stopping. There's no need to suppose that they were especially cold-hearted people. Perhaps they were afraid themselves and were hurrying to get to the city as quickly as possible, or perhaps they were inexpert and didn't know how to go about helping the man, especially since it looked as though he was quite beyond help anyway. At this point, a Samaritan comes along, presumably a merchant, who, who offered as occasion to traverse this stretch of road and is evidently acquainted with the proprietor of the nearest inn. A Samaritan... Someone, in other words, who does not belong to Israel's community of solidarity and is not obliged to see the assault victim as a neighbour. In this connection, in this connection, we need to recall that the previous chapter of the evangelist has recounted that on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus sent messengers ahead of him and that they entered a Samaritan village in order to procure lodgings. But the people would not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. The sons of thunder, James and John, became enraged and said, Lord, do you want us to build to bid fire to come down from heaven and consume them? The Lord forbade them to do so. Lodging was found in another village. And now the Samaritan enters the stage. What will he do? He does not ask how far his obligations of solidarity extend, nor does he ask about the merits required for eternal life. Something else happens. His heart is wrenched open. The gospel uses the, that uses that word in Hebrew had originally referred to a mother's womb and maternal care. Seeing this man in such a state is a blow that strikes him viscerally, touching his soul. He had compassion. That is how we translate the text today, diminishing its original vitality. Struck in his soul by the lightning flash of mercy, he himself now becomes a neighbour, heedless of any question of danger. The burden of the question thus shifts here. The issue is no longer which other person is a neighbour to me or not. The question is about me. I have to become the neighbour. And when I do, the other person counts for me as myself. So that's what I think I was saying. It extends to the Samaritan. And if an immigrant found himself on my, my doorstep or yours or anybody else's, we have a duty of care and compassion to feed, help uh, and, and be compassionate. It's not collective. We The, the problem is we've moved from the individual uh, respond, moral responsibility to a suffering hu human being who is our neighbour, not a member of our family, to the collective, and the moment you put in the collective, it becomes political. And the trick that's being played upon us is to, to wrench mass immigration out of the context, both of the Old Testament and out of the context of the Good Samaritan, to say nothing of the sheep and the goats, and to impose it upon us, involving a moral obligation that does not allow us to take concern for the host community and its 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 capacity to manage by producing the the immigrant as a victim. And because in socialist dogma, the victim always wins, we have theological categories adduced to support the victim without any questions being asked. It's moral and theological blackmail. It's not our responsibility to do that. Absolutely, we have individual responsibility. We don't have collective, national, political responsibility not to resist illegal migration. So the bishops are 
completely wrong, basically. We, we all agree about that. Yes, they we? are. Yeah. Well, I think they are. Yeah. I okay. think they're being black. I, know, I, I think they've, they've taken socialist dogma. And, and and what they're not doing is, an, the, so this, I was on GB News this afternoon and being asked about whether the Archbishop of Canterbury had the right to, to berate the Home Secretary about her immigration status. And one of my answers was, if he ever gave anything more than the left-wing socialist answer to any moral problem, you might want to take him seriously, but he doesn't, so you shouldn't. But that isn't even the issue. The, the issue is that the, 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 the way in which Christian public ethics has been hijacked by socialism means that you never hear people in, in responsible positions of the church taking the right-wing view, which is the alternative one. So what you have to do is you have to balance a left-wing social mandate with a right-wing social mandate. And sometimes you lean to the right and sometimes you lean to the left and sometimes you go to the middle. It depends upon the, the circumstances. But one of the reasons why we can't take seriously the people who lead either the Catholic or the Anglican or the Protestant churches is they always come out with a left-wing mandate because they've been blackmailed by socialist propaganda and they haven't examined their theological roots or the spe very specific ethical requirements of both the Old and the New Testament. And one of the huge differences is the extent to which in New the New Testament, compassion it begin, when it always begins with the individual, to what extent does it become collective? And that's the one, that's the thing we have to argue over. And that's partly why I was, was taking issue with Catherine talking about humanity as a family, because I don't think it is, and I don't think scripture says it is. But she is right when she says that some of our individual duties when they're expressed by the church, become collected. I'm sure that's true. And that's what, what I, get, what that, I mean that's by the that is, What I mean by that is, unlike in the Old Testament, this covenant is for all. This is for all humanity, for anybody. Uh, it won't be forced upon you, but your salvation is for anybody. Uh, redemption is for anybody. Jesus died for all of us, for every single person. He's died for all of us. We are, we are one human, Adam and Eve. But we no are one ever says that's not true. No, 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 agrees no with but, that. but but then but then how you manage the family and our nations and and the the politics that's a separate question. I don't disagree with you, but I, like you, I I'm concerned really with my my response as a Christian, and my worry about the response to the environment and immigration is that as a Christian, we're told that unless you accept this collectivist socialist idea of you know anyone's welcome no is that that is not compassionate that leads to human trafficking going undealt with that leads to people who are then at right risk there, from it? people it leads to social breakdown and people at risk mm. from uh, other people who don't perhaps well, yet assimilate have yet assimilated so i agree i think we agree politically but what drives my political persuasion is my faith and what I'm saying is I don't believe that my Catholic faith, call, faith calls me to have to accept unfettered immigration. It just doesn't. So I'm fed up of so the people telling me that <laughs> this is what you must, you must be, you must be, everything's the, the we're, we're responsible for the climate breakdown. You've got to go and recycle and have an electric car and you've got to welcome anyone, man, woman, whatever age, whether they're in danger or not, into the country. My faith tells me that is not true. So what I'm saying is it's it's, so it's, that's it's the very position of my Catholic faith that, that, that says I don't need to accept this. But it's not because I've oh. been got at by the left, by the right. And, you know, um, so we, we, we're in agreement, I think. That's very good. I like that. Well, you, you pose a question. What does my Christian faith require of me in terms of immigration and, eco and ecology? And the answer is it requires me to know the truth. And since no one's telling yeah. us the truth about immigration and they're not telling us the truth about ecology, um, it ought to be uh, a Christian duty to say we're going to discover the truth. And, and if the truth means that, that immigration as it's taking place is a disaster uh, and causes the most enormous danger to social cohesion, we should be able to say so without being labelled right wing. It's not right wing. No. And if it turns out that much of the economic rubbish, sorry, the, the, the economic stuff it is rubbish or being sold about ecology isn't true, we should be able to say so without being labelled right wing. But what the left have done is they've so weaponized compassion, which is why so many Christians have got on board with it, mm. that it becomes impossible to tell the truth without being thought to be not very nice. And that's a, that's a false dichotomy. And, and we need to try to resist it, even though people will call us fascists if we do. And it's actually very lazy. I think if you if you don't look beyond what you're being fed and you just say, well, then there's a there's real danger of causing harm to people, despite your need, your desire to be compassionate. There's real danger to some of these 
um, ideas, if they're left unchallenged, that great harm will be caused to our fellow man. Do people think that when they just say, well, this is the this is the nice thing to do. This is the compassionate thing to do. It's never that simple. There's always unintended consequences. Well, and the irony is that the, the church teaching is out there and it's not what the bishops are saying. Yeah. That's yeah. what I find yeah. the most frustrating <laughs> thing. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, brilliantly, you've both mentioned collectivism, which is condemned in the catechism and, in the you know, throughout the teaching of the church. Not to mention the fact that in the social compendium of, of Catholic teaching, it's... It, outright says that the you know the the right of migrants has got to be measured against the right to um patrol borders and control borders yeah. for the good of the population uh, so yeah. i just that it's dishonest <laughs> that's i think that's the that's my biggest problem look i'm not saying i'm right right say the three of us could be completely wrong but at least do us the at least Show us the, the the dignity of explaining your argument and not just saying exactly as you said. Basically, they just trot it out. Oh, welcome the stranger. Anything else? Okay. Yeah, but what? Yeah, exactly. What does that mean? Trade. Welcome the stranger. What? What does that? What does that even mean? You don't. You people saying it aren't welcoming strangers without any checks or uh, without any knowledge into their homes. Are they? Why aren't they doing that? Why aren't we welcome? Why aren't we leaving our front door well, open tonight? Pope Francis is saying that it's, it's the right, it's everyone's right to live in the country that they want to live. This is what he said in his letter on the World Meeting of Families. It isn't. And it's like, oh, all right. Well, let's, I think the Vatican State has got the highest standard of living for every individual in the whole world. Let's all move there. We've got a right to do so. You said so. It's just nonsense, isn't yeah, it? it is. You know? Yeah, it's complete nonsense. John Paul II, Pope, Pope John Paul II, very good on this and i'm now trying to think of um which encyclicals but uh maybe i'll put them in the links but he's and of course his experience of communism has given him a, a really i think a, a better and perhaps a more nuanced understanding uh but he's very good on on this definitely but he did actually um just let me yeah, see I haven't... it was at the world meeting of families i'll I did put actually... links in to the uh to the to the YouTube because people might want to have a look at them. Um, his writings, he's very good. So on the 2nd of February, 2001, Pope John Paul II addressed the 87th World Day of Migration and he made even more explicit the imperatives of the developed countries are not always able to assimilate all those who emigrate and that while the church strongly affirms the right to emigrate, certainly the exercise of such a right is to be regulated because practicing it indiscriminately may do harm and be detrimental to the common good of the community that receives the migrant. Right. 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 Brilliant. It's not complicated, is yeah, it? It's not complicated. No, it's not, nor is it. Everyone else could do it. Why can't Pope Francis do it? Because, they're, because they've, taken, they've taken a politically, taken a a political mm. um, perspective from the left. And, and yeah. again, I wouldn't mind. I, I, I could hear it from the Pope if I heard him occasionally take a political perspective from the right, if he seemed to be exercising discernment so that sometimes the uh, the position from the, the right, the conserving, the protecting, the maintaining took priority, and then sometimes change and renew, revolution, renewal took priority. But you, but you can't trust somebody. I, and I wouldn't trust somebody if they produced, I wouldn't trust a Christian leader if they always produce political resources from the right anymore. And I certainly won't do it from the left. But as it happens, both you Pope Francis and the Archbishop of Canterbury always do it from the left. I don't trust them politically. And that's, what, that's exactly the point. They're undermining their own authority. Yeah. And that's what really gets my goat about it. They yeah. don't seem to understand the gravitas of their role. And they should speak with a little bit of discernment before they come out of all this. It's just they're only doing it because it's easy. And if you look on social media, no one's engaging with it. And that's what they want. I really believe that's what they want. That's the ruffle any feathers, you know. If they had to talk about why we have to believe in Jesus Christ, then, then you know, some people would get upset, wouldn't they? So they don't want to do that. You know what also really does annoy me about this is – it's invariably the wealthiest, the people who are safest and better protected from any of the concerns that that people are raising about uh, migration or um, mm. zero emissions or something. The people that can least afford it, that are actually affected worse from it, 
and then the people who are very comfortable and who who the problems won't they won't see any of the real problems they won't be touched by it um it's very easy for them to say look how compassionate we are we'll welcome all the strangers we'll recycle or we'll get an electric car uh we won't drive around you know we'll it just it's really frustrating i mean i as a, i'm not i'm not playing the you know woe is me i'm i'm a poor you know i'm from i'm from a family of very poor irish immigrants you know my grandfather couldn't read or write my dad was a builder all his life and pulled out of school he couldn't be educated we couldn't afford it um i live in an area now in in near london which is really quite poor transient population and i'm friends with a lot of mums a lot of them are uh, my immigrants immigrant christian families they're working so bloody hard like they really are slaving away two or three jobs they get their kids from school they give them a bit of food mum or dad tag team and go out and do a late night shift through the night at a supermarket and they've got they've got concerns actually a lot of the my my friends who are immigrants have this have concerns about some of these policies that we're being told is so caring and compassionate to the migrants and you think you do sort of think well actually is it really or is it just something that you can pat yourself on the back over and say, look how look how good we are without really dig- digging deep and doing the hard work of, of, of learning and, and actually mixing with people outside of your, your little bubble? I'm so glad you've both been so passionate about this because I all week I've been thinking it's just me. I'm on my high horse, but I'm, <laughs> I thought it would be something. And ask, I think- ask, the RE teacher, ask the RE teacher from Batley how enriching he's found immigration. Yeah. Um, it, you, you cannot simply it's say Im- mm. immigration. It's not right, and and most <laughs> most of the voices I've heard, es- exercising, um, asking the caution be exercised on mass immigration, have, as Catherine has just pointed out, come from recent immigrants because they know very well they li- they live in a very precarious position, and the capacity for them to be assimilated and to engage in a society that re- retains some level of stability is enormously jeopardized by unlimited immigration. The whole con- the whole pack of cards, the house of cards will come down. And so of course they're concerned that the rest of society should exercise care about the balance between immigrants and, and those who live indigenously. Anyway, I just wanted to say that there's not a theological mandate for the left-wing blackmail that requires us not to ask questions about the truth about immigration. Well, I think this has been a very good conversation. Thank you both. It's good. Thank you. I, I'm I'm glad we've talked about the climate, and I think I think it's a real it's a real issue and it's a real problem. So thank you both. It does mean that our list might need to be shortened, uh, and we might try and fit in a midweek podcast to to address some more of it. But maybe could we go to the noisy Catholics? The nuncio to Washington has said noisy U.S. Catholics should listen to the Pope. Did you read about that, Mark? Yeah, I did a bit, but uh, you know. He really winds me up, that US nuncio. Gavin and I did a podcast which was released during the week about Bishop Strickland. Yeah, Obviously, this listens. is aimed at Bishop Strickland or any, you know, anyone else on the podcast. I, I can't help but feel that what he's saying really is, um, you know, anyone who disagrees with the Pope should shut up, mm. which is just, you know, OK, fine. When the Pope stops uh, promoting to Cardinal people like Fernandez who have covered up child abuse in their diocese, when he stops covering for Marco Rupnik, who's abused all these, you know, when he yeah. stops doing those things, well, shut yeah. up. He's yeah. the one who did Vos Estes. He's the one who did zero tolerance. Yeah. And I think it all, you know, really interestingly, uh, Bishop Strickland did a really good interview with Robert Moynihan it, just yesterday, last night. Like, literally, I clicked on it as it happened, and he talks a lot, you know. And in this, in this interview, he says he hasn't heard anything from anyone since the the apostolic um, where it was it was two american bishops who visited him but it was under the auspices of a of an investigation from the vatican and um he hasn't had any communication so all there is is rumors so they haven't even had the decency to clear up the rumors or whatever as gavin said on our podcast i think they're probably going more you know should we it, like if they if they kick him out then he's just going to be a, a bishop without mandate and he can just go around the country rabble Rousing and being another Vigano or you know Schneider or Muller or whatever, so so it probably causes them more problem than it's worth. Um, but basically, but I mean, in that interview, he's just saying, I, you know, I'm not a, a complex man, I'm not a sophisticated man, but I really, really believe in the gospel and Jesus Christ. You can't help but love 
nothing, you know. <laughs> so no, don't shut up, Bishop of Tyler. You're brilliant. Yeah. We love you. The American people love you. Thank you very much for standing up for the gospel. Yeah, exactly that. And I'm going like to promote. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go on, Christine, David. Yeah. I just, want to, on. I just I want to do to do what Catherine was already started to do, which is to promote that podcast on Merely Catholic because Mark was brilliant. First of all, he put it a whole. He gave a whole lot of information. That, that I had only grasped very loosely. And the fact is that the Pope's present position against um, Bishop Strickland and the other bishops, it has a history. And what Mark does in the podcast is he explains what the history is. But right back at the back of the history is an Argentinian prejudice against North America. Uh, and, it, and it keeps on coming out. And the fact that the problem that we have, one of the problems we have with Pope Francis is that his inner Bergoglio is a, is a classic... Um, it's, it's, a, it's a classic South American uh, uh, prejudiced position against North America. And it keeps on coming out, but expressing itself as a theological position instead of a psychological and a political one. But actually, it's psychological <laughs> and political. And that's one of the reasons why I've been putting the boot in traditionalist Catholics. And, and, and as Mark quite rightly said, they, they just tested the waters by letting this rumour go to see what would happen, to see if Strickland could be topped, tipped over the side to, to um, or to see if other people were pushed into schism or expressing loud, unguarded remarks like, like Altman did, <laughs> in which case I'm, it succeeded, uh, I'm sadly. Doing my, and so... I'm shuffling my papers, Gavin, because uh, as much as I love to hear what you have to say, I love even more to hear what you have to say about Teze because I don't want to finish without speaking about this. Um, Christopher Lamb interviewed this new prior of Teze for the Tablet podcast, um, which you should go and listen to, because I think if you listen to it alongside... No, do you know why, Mark? Do you know, Mark? Because if you listen to it if alongside you to Gavin... Sleep, if you listen... I mean, Mark fell asleep, but if you listen alongside Gavin's Merely Catholic podcast, uh, we've talked about left and right... Uh, I don't, I don't, you know, they're not their political terms really. But but listen to everything you see, and I think what what you make of it. But I think um, I found it uh, very interesting indeed. And Gavin, you spent many years at Teze uh, as an Anglican a priest and uh, then bishop. I say it gets stuck in my throat uh, to say that, but. Um, so it should get stuck in your throat. Yeah, so um, cool at the time. I, the so I'm tell in... us what you listen to this. I listen to this. Mark fell asleep to this, and uh, it was it was <laughs> it was really poor. I really want to get you on if if you listen to it. This idea of blessed bread. So first of all, um, who is this man? What's the history of Teze? And what's this nonsense about? Uh, what do we really? What should ecumenism and unity really mean? Go. This is going to be difficult to do in a condensed. That's why I wanted to try and hurry it in. Sorry. So, so first of all, I wrote an article about the ecumenical, about the synod, the secret synod, which has syncretistic tendencies, beginning with an ecumenical service. Because I think, but a bit like left wing politics, we get blackmailed by, by ecumenism. Ending ecumenical is therefore good and nice. Um, one of the things that's happened since I've become a Catholic is I've changed my views on ecumenism. And I think now the, the ecumenical imperative is for people to become Catholics. I'm completely unashamed about that because I believe the Protestant church teaches ecumenism. Of course, yeah. yes. Well, the church because teaches the pro- this experiment has failed, uh, and so C.S. Lewis said in, in mathematics, as in philosophy, if you discover that the the point, you need to discover where your working went wrong and go back and start again. So the working went wrong at the Reformation, and I've embodied that in my own journey. And so, would be surprised if I didn't believe in it. So when ecumenism is used as a fig leaf to make something look nicer or more acceptable without actually doing the hard work, I mean, for example, one one of the things they're doing uh, is that is they're setting up two interfaith uh, booths to encounter Islam and Buddhism in case there's something they could learn from Islam. I bet you they won't be learning about the way in which Christians are are, are burnt to death. <laughs> And persecuted mm. in in Pakistan for so-called blasphemy. They won't be. They nor will they be learning that both Buddhism and Islam are predicated on essentially calling Jesus a liar and the Gospels unreliable because they are. But be that as it may, let's go back to ecumenism. One of the things I discovered from the Lamb podcast was that the ecumenical vigil happened because the previous prior of Teze went to was involved in the discussions about instrumentum laboris and put his hand up from the back of the class and said. 
could, would you like to begin with an ecumenical vigil? They say, I can organize it. Because Teze love to organize ecumenical vigils. It's what they do. So both their needs are met here. Teze gets to feel useful. Uh, the people doing the synod get to feel virtuous and they have an ecumenical vision. But, but what's the, what does the point of the ecumenism? Because there are two kinds. First of all, uh, there are, for example, some very useful Protestant charisms the church ought to learn about. It ought to learn about the way in which evangelicals know their Bibles and live them. And it ought to learn about the way in which Pentecostalism is a growing denomination because it offers the gifts of the spirit within an ecclesial context. If you want to be ecumenical, you might want to say these are things we should explore further. If you also want to be ecumenical, you might want to look at the way in which liberal Protestant theology has obsessed itself with sex and politics and the environment and is dying on its feet. So here we are. There are two ways of learning ecumenically, one, one which is good for the church and one which is bad for the church. Will they do that? They won't do that at all. It will just be a let's be nice to each other fest and ignore yes, the theological differences without any act of, without any act of collective discernment, mm -hmm. without inviting the Protestants to consider the damage they've done to the church and to the mission, and whether or not they ought to pay more attention to the church's tradition, which they don't understand and constantly misrepresent. Mm -hmm. So when I wrote about the um, ecumenical vigil, uh, for clothes not being in place, uh, the next thing I did was to hear the present prior of Teze. So there's a new prior of Teze, and I'm very interested in him. I loved Brother Roger, who was the prior, until he was murdered by an Albanian immigrant who'd come into France illegally and stabbed him in the neck in the middle of Vespers. Uh, and I wasn't so sure about his successor. Um, but to talk, to so say Teze has two things. It has some very, very wonderful virtues and some really useless <laughs> theology. Its virtues are that the Holy Spirit has chosen to use the community to Christianity. Uh, and that and it's done it by the use of hesychastic prayer in the form of the most wonderful music. And you have to say that the people who've joined them and the count the community as monks have shown heroic virtue. Good for them, as monks always do. do. But, but one of the things Tese hasn't done is it hasn't taken its evangelism seriously. So the kind of gospel that people are presented there with is a form of French existentialism meets 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 happy relativism. Uh, and, and you can go through a whole week in Tese hearing very little about Jesus himself or the demands of the gospel and a great deal about walking together and open mindedness. <laughs> and, uh, and God forbid us meeting the stranger, wherever the stranger happens to be. Um, so the new, the new, the new prior is an Anglican. Up really well, haven't they? <laughs> and, 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 and I thought, what, why is the new? What, why is the new? Why have they chosen an Anglican? And the answer is because the gift lies entirely within the outgoing prior. I thought, well, maybe he's learned a few things in his time in Teze because I certainly did, and I heard him talk the most unreflective guff about ecumenism. Just to give you an example, the downside of Teze is that um, because there are Catholic monks there, they decided they would have the Catholic Mass as the as the main liturgy. So the, the Catholic Eucharist is there. Then they, then they said, however, we know there are non-Catholics here. So what should non-Catholics do? Well, they can, if it suits their conscience, take the Catholic sacrament. I don't agree with that anymore. Um, but, but just in case, because the rules are the rules, we'll have a basket of baguette as blessed bread to the side. Now, in practice, Nobody touches that flipping baguette. Uh, and, and, and a couple of embarrassed, pimply teenagers turn out every morning, stand there looking like dorks while no one goes near them. And everyone goes to the romantic monks and receives the Catholic host. There yeah, is no the oversight. Real stuff, don't you? Everyone wants the real stuff. Yeah, that's, but that's of, that course they, of course they want the real stuff. But the point is, they're not told it's the real stuff. Yeah. They're not told there's a difference between Catholic Mass and either Blessed Bread or Anglican Eucharist. And the whole thing is actually, it's it. we're back to Catholics, but they're not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine there have been some quite fairly serious standoffs um, amongst Catholic bishops in France. The conservative ones were very alarmed about this, and the Vatican II ones were absolutely thrilled about it. Uh, and Tezé's walked a very delicate balance all the way through, which looked like it might have been becoming more Catholic when Brother Alois became the second prior. Yeah. Now we have a third prior. Uh, and as I listened to him, I hoped that some level of serious theological and ecumenical reflection might be found in his remarks. And it was like listening to a time capsule from mm. 1968 from a man whose third phrase at every point was walking together. Oh, can I just say and, the, and the, just, the 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 yeah, um, start, okay. sorry the the no 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 please it's 
very very interesting but um you're absolutely right he kept, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> the, he kept referring it. oh goodness me there goes my battery he kept referring to vatican ii in fact that was very interesting he yeah kept, he did. kept justifying things by quoting and, and uh, referring to vatican ii so that's an interesting thing but secondly yeah, so they talked about blessed bread so do listen to the podcast and see what you think for yourselves um and he said uh the reason we bless bread is so that nobody feels excluded from receiving something, which is odd, very odd, I think. Then Lamb, Christopher Lamb says, it's really trying to put ecumenism and Christian unity into action. And they sort of congratulated oh, themselves on that. He's like a scalpel, that man, isn't he? Huh? He's What's like that? a scalpel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he <laughs> There's said, no hiding then, from Lamb's intellect. I know. Uh, it's very odd. And then... And then the the man says again, and I don't remember his name, not lamb, the other one, uh, goat, no. The way the way in which we live the Eucharist Brother is Matthew, a, Brother Matthew. Brother Matthew, sorry. The way in which we live the Eucharist <laughs> is a step on the journey, but what we want, it's getting dark in here, so I'm looking at my writing, what we want is full communion. And I thought this is an odd thing to say, because what does that mean? It's a step on the journey to where? It suggests that there's an end point. The end point isn't schism. The end point isn't everyone just doing their thing. The end point is the is the, is being part of the body of Christ, the one body of Christ, uh, Holy Mother Church, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That is the end point. And I'm thinking as, as he's speaking, I'm thinking, what's stopping you you're very welcome to join and receive the body of Christ and become a Catholic. You don't have to eat your blessed baguette uh, to to feel included. Otherwise, what are you being included in? To me, it could just be a cheese sandwich. Why even, you know, it, it's irrelevant what it is. If it's just about inclusion, get a couple of Yorkie bars. What's it? I'm not trying to be rude. I'm really not. And I'm speaking as a cradle Catholic and maybe I don't understand. But to me, it's just very bizarre. So there's all of that, Gavin. You're not being you're not I'm being rude plug enough. In. Oh, <laughs> you're, you're not you're not being rude enough because because Brother Matthew made no distinction between receiving the real body of Christ in the miracle of the Mass for the transformation of your soul and having some baguette because you wouldn't feel excluded. As if the, as if all that matters is it doesn't matter which of those happens so long as you don't feel excluded. That is so blasphemous towards That's the Mass. Feelings, it is Gavin. so it's denigrating to Jesus. Yeah, it's all about feelings and you know yeah. once it, it's it's this this blackmail again yeah backing about Teze is it could have done some extraordinary things on the ecumenical front because it set out with the most enormous ambition to 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 deal with the fact that you had people from from the one true church and different protestant denominations living together and it's never done it all it's done is to hide the difficulties under a blanket of warm ecumenical verbiage, and the, and for 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 them, for that community with its all its theological waffle to be invited to start the uh, the, 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 the the this new synod, and, and you know I listened very carefully to see it because from time to time Brother Matthew quoted Instrumentum Laboris, he had absolutely no awareness whatsoever of what the issues are that are going on. In fact, he denied the fact. He said some people. This is a secret agenda. Lamb set him up for this because this is the thing that Lamb is trying to stop happening. Um, and they had they they simply said, no, no, instrumental laborious is the most straightforward of documents. It's not remotely couched in Marxist language. It is not remotely assume all the categories of wokery before it even begins. Of course it does. And but the fact that they weren't aware of it and they didn't know it and they rejected it shows a level of theological myopia or dishonesty that is really seriously problematic. Let's go back to Catherine saying, what's the responsibility of Christians in the, in these particular complex cases? And the answer is, it's to tell the truth. Yeah, yeah. And and if we sell them anything less, I think it's what's really sad. I spoke to you two. I, I, I was speaking with a, a young member of my family just recently who is in a terrible state. She's a young woman and she... Uh, has lost a sister to suicide, a, a father to illness. She's had no faith growing up and she's really lost. And and she she turned to me and said, you've got something. There's something about you and I don't know what it is. I've never seen anything like it in anyone. And it was just, I mean, I, it is, I think it was just her seeing a person of faith, taking their faith seriously. And for someone like this, and, and I'm, dare I say, she was, in, she is an incredibly broken person um god love her 
Um, but she is calling, almost literally calling out and saying, I need something to hang my life on. And it isn't walking together, eating a bit of blessed bread. Um, you're fine as you are. Here's a pat on the back. And, and when you're in tears, I'm going to give you a nice hug. That's all lovely. It's all very nice. But it doesn't, you can't hang your coat on it, let alone anything else. It's it's nothing. It offers nothing. And my worry is that there are really broken and desperate and sad and hurt people who need more than what this man was talking about at Teze, I'm afraid. And, the, and the, all this blather just robs the cross of its yeah, power. Rob, that's, yeah, yes. That's, 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 yes. That's right. Yeah. Robs the cross of its power. That's absolutely brilliant and so true. Yeah. Very good. I muted my microphone a moment ago to stop, stop the clocks. Has it, have I muted myself or can you hear me? No, we can I can hear you. hear you, but I think we are breaking down a little bit because I, I, my, I think my um, microphone and and uh, camera is starting to get jittery. And I realised we had a much longer list. But given that we've been running for about an hour, unless there's any burning desire to to talk about any other issue, should we try and meet midweek and do another catch up? Yes. Yeah. That's good. And and call it a day for now. Well, thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. It's it's nice. It's unscripted. You saw how unscripted it was. Mark was reaching for a book and trying to read a page aloud, um, uh, responding exactly to what we were talking about in the moment. So um, forgive us. It, because it is unscripted, some people say things, you know, this is a bit unprofessional or this camera doesn't work or this microphone's a bit shoddy. We're doing the very best we can with what we've got. And we're hoping to be able to get some funding and uh, do a bit more and produce an even more professional output but for the moment we're doing our very best so thank you for continuing to watch and to share and please keep doing so i'm catherine bennett i'm mark lambert and i'm gavin ashenden and i rather like that bloke who said catholic unscripted is really mrs bennett and the two gentlemen <laughs> god bless you <laughs> <laughs>